Hi, and welcome to the review for the Panasonic Lumix DMC LX5 digital camera, which you'll see here. It, uh, wow. It normally comes with a lens cap that's removable, but I replaced it with, um, it's kind of automatic shutter. Because, uh, seriously, I'm one lazy guy when it comes to removing lens caps. And also, it's pretty annoying because, uh, this is a compact camera. And as such, kind of tend to keep it in your book bag, or if you have a really large pocket, you can keep it in your pocket. And so, you know, when, when you're trying to quickly get a snapshot off during vacation, or if you're just on the street, having to take off that lens cap, it's kind of one extra step that, that keeps you away from being able to take that perfect, uh, that perfect photo that uh, captures the moment that um, was not supposed to be scripted out. I'm not going to talk too much about the technical specs about this, but I will go over some of it. <coughs> Let's see. Um, very, very quickly, the uh, it's a 10 megapixel camera, which we'll actually get into later, because uh, um, as any digital photographer knows, it's, it's not necessarily about the megapixels when you're taking photos. Uh, a lot of other factors um, play into this. The light sensitivity is 3,200 ISOs. Uh, light sensitivity uh, boost is uh, 12,800 ISO. Uh, true resolution, 10 megapixels. Native resolution is 3,648 by 2,736 pixels. Um, it has uh, an LCD. Uh, no, no, um, what's it called? No viewfinder, but only a digital viewfinder. Um, and the uh, the LCD size is uh, three inches uh, diagonally. Uh, there's no touch screen, which uh, I don't think is a bad uh, deal. And the screen does not flip out. So I mean, for those of you taking kind of like over the head shots, this may not be the camera for you. However, there will be a lot more that this camera can do that a lot of those uh, flip flippy types uh, might not be able to. The um, optical zoom is 3.8. It's a wide-angle lens, 24 millimeters. Telephoto lens, 90 millimeters. Um, its aperture at wide angle is uh, f-stops 2.0, and its aperture at uh, telephoto is f-stop 3.3. Macro focus is within one centimeter. Um, now, you know, as, as you can see, its form factor it is it is pretty small, and this is compared to my Nexus 4 by Google. As you can see here, it's slightly smaller than it, and maybe about you know, three or four times the uh, the width of it. Well, we'll get back to that. Once again, it's really not too uh, important right now. Um, the format for uh, recording videos is uh, 720p at 30 um, frames per second. Um, so this is not the, the highest definition camera, but then again, this is also nearly, um, I think uh, I'd have to say maybe three or four years old almost at the shooting of this uh, review. Um, Alright, so let's see what else. Uh, in terms of performance, there's a startup delay of uh, of uh, very little. <laughs> Over here they've, they've listed as 2,300 milliseconds, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, that's probably a um, quarter, quarter of a second. There's a shutter lag of 310 milliseconds, which is even less than that, I suppose. Uh, its battery life is listed as at about 400 shots um, per charge, per full charge, of course. And uh, continuous shooting, six frames per second. Uh, there is autofocus on it, and uh, the max shutter speed is uh, one in 4,000 seconds, and its minimum is a full minute. So that's pretty good. Um, that's also pretty unique as far as uh, uh, these compact cameras go. Uh, there is a built-in flash that pops up. And so, you will not find yourself in one of those situations where uh, a flash goes off when you kind of didn't want it to, let's say, during a, a concert or maybe if you're in a public area. Uh, if you're one of those types that uh, takes pictures of their food. Now, uh, this is going to be one of the last reviews that I'm going to make recording with my iPod Touch. And I think it's fairly obvious the reason why. It's because this is the camera that I've chosen to use to record all future recordings with can't very well do a re review using this. 
So let's get into meat of this. Um, this is an this is an amazing camera, and one of the biggest reasons I got it is because it 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 has widescreen basically function built in. Now this is a little bit different. Uh, well, that is to say, it's it's obviously different from cameras that nowadays do panoramic. <coughs> excuse me, panoramic shots. Now um, the way pan panoramic shots work nowadays is you the your camera would t take one photo. Excuse me, holy crap, I burped. Take one photo, can you move the camera, and then you take another one. Now, the unfortunate thing about these are, uh, uh, it, it has to do a lot with now algorithms, and uh, occasionally the the uh, program within the camera may not be able to stitch them uh, together uh, as great as just taking one nice clear widescreen shot. But but that's but that's my preference. Um, panoramic shots shots definitely have uh, their niche. Um, I'm not against them, but I definitely would not want to rely on it if I wanted one great picture and I didn't have time to uh, to mess about. Um, this is the camera that I use actually during concerts, uh, which are uh, notorious for being low light situations and on vacation. Now, there's a couple features with this camera that some of you may be wondering about, so I'll uh, go over it very quickly here now. Uh, when you're holding a smaller camera, typically they don't have this kind of uh, build, and as you can see here, um, it's actually got a got a handle. So it's this this camera, despite being much larger than the average compact camera, um, is a lot easier to hold with one hand uh, in order to shoot and hold with one hand. Um, now let's turn this baby on. And so when you're taking the photo, you can easily grip the surface right over here. And then hold on to this and, and snap as many pictures as you want. And uh, that's going to be easy peasy. Now, most digital cameras nowadays are going to be built a lot closer to a cell phone, where it's kind of like got a flat surface that way you can put in your pocket or, uh, in a in woman's case, put in your purse. And of course, the problem with this would be um, it, it's not exactly easy to hold. I mean, you can hold it, it's just going to be a little bit more difficult uh, to hold with one hand steadily. Uh, which is exactly what the grips are for. So this is this is a grip tip, typically found on uh, you know kind of DSLR cameras, and so we'll we'll get into another reason why I bought this now. Uh, let me just do a quick kind of. I'm not sure whether or not it will it'll show that much, but show that much difference. But um, a typical lens nowadays would capture, let's say. Just about this. Now it goes from that circle. Uh, I'm going to point this out now here. It'll go from this edge all the way to halfway up this uh, red uh, little uh, device that I got there, a little USB thing. So, well, we'll keep this in mind. Let's see. However, with the widescreen, <coughs> it'll uh, it'll capture everything where we go from one end of my uh, of this little red shelf that I have all the way to the other end. Now, this makes a huge difference when you're taking pictures. Uh, I mean, as you can tell right now, uh, we've we've got a, about a one foot give, but this makes more of a difference when you're on the street. And this is exactly the reason why I got a camera like this. Widescreen is uh, a widescreen telephoto shot is definitely useful nowadays because when you're are taking those photos you know you're gonna run into tall buildings you're gonna run into kind of tight spaces and now you don't need to have to back up and you don't need to have to compromise the amount of building or what what kind of shot you need to get in order to get kind of uh, everything you want into the photo um, worst case scenario you crop something out but uh, when you do have a smaller uh, non telephoto lens you wouldn't get all the detail and that's when you'll have to try to you know um, use uh, a panoramic shot or, or something like that. Anyway, uh, these are extremely clear and uh, at the end of this video, after I slightly just review the uh, the way this camera is, we'll go over some of the photos that I've taken throughout the years with them. Uh, this this baby is, is, is rock solid. It's got a metal casing um, and I know that I'm reviewing the LX5 a bit late now because uh, they have the most recent model that came out just about four or five months ago, the LX6. I mean, uh, 7. Excuse me. Unfortunately, I've heard that the LX7 
Um, although it was an improvement over this, actually uses uses a plastic case, which I'm really just not fond of because I, I love this case being metal. Um, not not that I drop things, but it, it just feels sturdy and you feel like it will last. And so, uh, yeah. So we've got this here. And, and obviously, if you, if you uh, were to put this in your bag with your keys or something, you wouldn't be so worried about uh, uh, scratches affecting the, uh, the look of it. Now, let me think what else uh, I want to go over before we switched over the pictures. Now, I've already shown you the difference between what a telephoto lens and... Um, and a normal lens would offer. Um, obviously the other thing would be uh, this has a much brighter lens than the average uh, camera and so what this means is that during concerts, during low light situations, it's able to absorb that much more light. This is typically only something of uh, a feature of high-end uh, cameras uh, which which obviously would include DSLRs. Now this thing had an opening price, well I bought it for uh, about $425 uh, just about two years ago, I think you may be able to get it, snag it for something around 370, 380. And the reason why this thing retains so much value is because it is such a great camera. This is basically the only camera you need to buy if you are interested in taking amazing photos but not willing to take the plunge on buying a DSLR. Uh, so, th in in other words, buying this camera is the equivalent of buying the the cheapest cheapest DSLR with the cheapest kit. And for the size, it's amazing. So that, that's another thing that I also kept in mind when I was buying a, buying a camera. Uh, just wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to take the plunge on a DSLR. Also knowing that if you buy a DSLR uh, and you want to go out and take photos, you're going to have to bring the entire kit with you. You're going to have to bring this, this giant camera with you in, in, in a specialized case. And you almost feel like if you bring it out, you have to take photos. Otherwise, you've wasted your own time. And uh, if you're on vacation for maybe a week... Uh, or two weeks, uh, there's a chance that you may not really want to bring that camera with you everywhere you go. Um, which is where this camera really comes into play. Now, th there's the direct competitor um, by Sony, uh, or, or Canon, I don't know, but the designation is, uh, I believe, the S95, S100, and S110. So you guys can look it up, whether that's a Canon, Sony, or, uh, or other. Um, both of these are extremely good cameras in low light situations and both of them have telephoto lenses however I just like the form factor of this camera better um, as well as I just love kind of electronics that has uh, that are built in white and the fact that this baby came in uh, both white and black was definitely a selling point for me um, and so what this is is uh, uh, because of the bright lens I was able to use this during concerts and I've taken amazing photos with this uh, photos where people who have brought in DSLR cameras uh, especially if they're amateur uh, DSLR uh, photographers this this camera takes pictures that are comparable to it uh, you would not be able to tell the difference if I had not told you and if you didn't look up the EXIF data that this was not taking DSLR photos I mean uh, you know I, I you know it, it may seem like I'm tooting my own horn here but it's just that when I do take photos I, uh, I do practice quite a bit before actually heading into a concert or uh, or whatever or taking photos at night because I need to know the weaknesses of my own camera. Now this is a mindset that a lot of people should have when they are buying camera. As a result, if, if you're going to buy this camera for a major vacation that you're coming up, uh, what, that's coming up for you, uh, you should really buy this camera as soon as possible. That way you can get yourself acclimated to its features and uh, be able to use it great on that vacation. A problem that a lot of people have um, when they are buying digital cameras is that uh, it's, it's one of the last purchases that they make. They believe that they can buy a video, uh, a digital camera a day before they leave, charge it up, you know, un unpack it, charge it up, bring it on vacation with them, and bam, they're going to have great photos. But of course, the unfortunate thing is every camera is different. Uh, every camera has a bunch of settings that work a little bit different from each other according to uh, the software, uh, and the hardware that's inside and and it does take time to get used to you need to know the weaknesses of your camera and um, when you're taking nighttime photos obviously when things are moving it's not gonna work but when things are perfectly still so let's say when you're taking a scenic photo those are gonna come up spectacularly and some people are gonna be like well these are taking terrible photo photos but but no that's not that's not the case here you just need to know how to use your camera and uh, and really take advantage of either the strengths or the weaknesses of it. 
Uh, and when I say take advantage of a weakness, that might seem kind of strange, but what I'm talking about is um, if, we're ta if, if we're taking, let's say, moving photos in the dark uh, where things are moving by quickly, you can always set this uh, uh, to have a longer shutter time. That way, what, uh, let's say a car is going to pass by you. you. You set this baby for two minutes. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say two minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, two, two or three seconds. And as the car passes by, what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to get its light trail instead of, of just like a blurry car. And everything else in the background is going to be clear. And that's kind of what I mean by taking advantage of a weakness. It's not going to take a clear shot of the, of, the, of the car that's driving by because it's too late. And it's too dark in order for the lens to absorb it. Rather than, rather than suffering through crappy pictures, you've, you've maximized what this camera can do versus what this camera could not do, and, and I think that's the point of learning uh, about cameras. Now, um, if any of you guys have questions, I'm more than open to hearing about them, and uh, I know that thus far this, this review has been a little uh, boring because uh, there's really not much I can show you about this camera that I'm not going to show you using pictures that's going to explain a lot more. So uh, without further ado, here are those pictures. Okay, now on to the second portion of my review for the LX5 is uh, here's a photo that I taken in Madison Square Garden uh, during under concert conditions with low light situation. So as you can see, uh, the girls aren't moving uh, particularly a lot, so it, it made the camera take a photo quality that's uh, that much better. Um, uh, but you can see that there's a lot of details in the background, and it's uh, pretty pretty decent for this kind of situation. Now moving on. This next photo, uh, they are in movement here, and so uh, I'm focusing on the center girl, but you can also see the details of their legs and their costumes that it's still pretty high. Um, they're not moving too quickly, so the photo still comes out pretty well, and I am using uh, almost uh, full zoom here uh, for this photo. Um, <coughs> As anybody who's taking concert photos know that you're not going to get this kind of detail with a normal point and shoot uh, for most of the occasion. On to the next photo. Now, uh, this girl was moving in pretty quickly uh, while my camera was almost at full zoom. So, uh, you know, this isn't the best photo. But again, you can see the details of her legs and her costume. Um, I did cut off the top of her head on accident. And... Uh, and so, you know, uh, once again, but you can see the details of the people uh, or the fans off to the side, which really shows you because they're probably jumping, screaming, yelling, trying to get photos. And they're, you know, they're all pretty clear considering, once again, this is a concert photo. Uh, moving on, this is the AKB concert that was in 2012 in Washington, D.C. And you can see here they're almost in full motion. Now, the amount of lighting at this concert was a step down from Madison Square Garden. And so uh, the details aren't going to be that great. This is nearly full zoom. And um, you can see all the details of the flowers and and, and her costume here, which I, I thought was uh, amazing and, and great and uh, whatever. So we're moving on to the next photo here. Uh, once again, another photo from the same concert. You can see everybody's captured pretty well. The girl in the foreground is off, is obviously uh, the girl that's uh, my main focus here. Everybody else in the background seems a little blurred out, but uh, it's because the the venue actually had some smoke machines going. So uh, that's not a that's not a function of the camera, and more of a function of of something that they wanted lighting effects to really. Um, see and I, th I believe in the next photo you'd see just about why um uh this this particular song has even less lighting than the ones that preceded it so you can kind of have an idea of how this camera performs in, under that situation there's a distracting exit sign but you can also see the spotlights here are casting some really nice light streams uh onto the girls and uh you can also see that there is some detail, but it's not as great as the other ones because, once again, the lighting isn't as great uh, here. But once again, this is a concert photo. Moving on, uh, you can really, really see what the uh, what the fog machines were uh, doing with the spotlights here, uh, as uh, every spotlight has a really attractive, you know, lightsaber kind of stream going on, and uh, all the girls are in full motion. You do see some. Uh, some uh, blurring around the the dresses and their skirts because they are you know kind of flipping them about but you can see for the most part during this concert I've, I've captured quite a lot of detail here uh, on to the next photo now this photo I've chose specifically because there is a harsh light yellow background 
uh, with a foreground kind of dull blue light. Under normal circumstances, especially with normal point and shoots, and especially with uh, cell phone cameras, you're not going to be able to capture this amount of detail here. Um, and it's it's most likely the foreground, uh, the girls in the foreground are usually just going to look like silhouettes. But here we've we've captured some detail there, um, even though it's not the best photo. Now moving on to much more uh, uh, normal photos here. This is a photo of outside uh, Gundam in Ondaiwa, Tokyo. Um, I've shot the back of this, and so you can see where the light source is coming from off to the right. But also, it's it's kind of shining against the Gundam, and you can see the details in the sky. The sky, uh, the uh, the clouds look fairly white. They don't look gray as some cameras might do. And you can also see the the details in the backpack and the details in the leaves. Uh, moving on. Uh, here is a fish that just photobombed me. This is a shot that I took with macro on, hoping that a fish would get in the way, and indeed it did. Uh, if you can't see the details, I'll be uploading all the photos into one zip, so you can see them all, uh, in case you can't see the details on YouTube. Um, but you can see uh, kind of the details in his mouth, and, and kind of the pot marks, kind of goosebumps in, in the skin, in the texture of the skin over here. Um, there's a reflection on my camera there, which isn't too attractive, though. Uh, moving on. This is a photo in which I was tracking the subject in the foreground, so anybody walking off to my right at a certain speed would look like they are much more in focus than anybody else. Uh, this was a dark day, uh, very cloudy, uh, maybe around midday, and so uh, everybody else in the background looks blurred because I'm only focusing on the four, well, more like the girl in the foreground that's that's moving around. Um, so if you've, you're interested in that kind of photo, this, this, this thing can definitely... Uh, pull something like that off. Now into the next photo. This one is a photo in which I actually tried. However, I forgot my tripod, so uh, this was just my camera leaning against um, something. So this is a 10-second exposure uh, in pitch black night, and you can see that it picked up quite a lot of detail. So you, you just so you have an idea of how much detail this thing is going to pick up at nighttime. But uh, once again, 10-second exposure, so it's definitely something that you would normally need uh, a tripod in, in order to accomplish here. Um, here's a macro photo uh, taken, which is the extreme opposite of the other one, uh, uh, that roughly uh, was taken from about two to three inches away from the subject. And you can see I'm focusing mainly on the body there, which is why the tip of the antenna is kind of blurred. But you can see a lot of the tails in his mouth and the little hair nubs from his uh, arms. I believe this is a praying mantis. If not, I'm sure some biologist is going to uh, get on my case and correct me but yeah uh so you can see the details you can even see the little grains of uh, dirt under him moving on here's a typical nighttime shot now this was according to exif data for this photo um it was taken one fortieth of a second which is a typical uh 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 exposure for a nighttime shot when you're just one-handing it without a without a tripod so this is what you you're gonna get in a typical city um you would see that some of the bright lights are beginning to wash out the uh, the signs, but you know that's that's what you encounter when you are taking a nighttime photo. Moving on, here's another nighttime photo with a bit of a longer exposure. However, um, it was still taken without a tripod and just by hand. And so what this is is uh, I believe it was one fifteenth of a second, which is a little longer than the other one, which means that you have to keep your hand still for that much longer. You can see that there is more washout with uh, the the lighted. Uh, signs and back where uh, some of them you, you can't catch some of the details uh, coming out of it. Uh, next photo is a quick photo that I took which really helps show how useful it is to have a camera that has a quick startup time. I was in the middle of crossing the street, brought the camera out because I saw a panda bus and as I was walking took it out of my bag and snapped this photo while still walking. This bus driver had no interest in stopping so uh, this bus was in motion at the time, uh, as was I, and you can kind of see in the background. It's not the prettiest photo, but uh, everything is in focus and, and clear, something that's great for vacation photos. Moving on, <clears throat> here's a photo taken during the Tokyo Game Show 2012. Um, you can see here, uh, this is also when a widescreen kind of telephoto lens comes in handy because, I uh, don't know if you can tell, I'm, I'm relatively close to the subject, but I've still caught a lot of good detail uh, using the rule of thirds, as photographers do. Uh, to create a pleasing to the eye photo, despite the fact that there's a lot of garbage in the background. So, yeah, uh, I think this is <clears throat> uh, representative of the typical photo. Moving on, photo inside a dark convention hall. You can see in the background just how dark it is 
and uh, the amount of trouble that one might take. Uh, but yeah, the flash photography boots up really quick and it takes focus really quick. Unlike some where it would take an extra second or so in order to focus and then take a photo, uh, resulting in a lot of blur occasionally. But you can see here everything is uh, clear as day. And despite the fact that the model on the right is moving, um, uh, all the details, her hair and arms, still in focus. Moving on. Uh, final photo from the Tokyo Game Show. Uh, just uh, I just chose this one because there was a lot of colors on it, and I think it's representative of a typical photo that you might take outside. Uh, again, no tripod. I was probably either squatting or on bended knee taking this photo, so there are people moving in the background, but uh, once again, my focus was on the model, and I wasn't particularly focused on anything else. Uh, lastly, here's a photo that I took with my Nexus 4, which is a representative, I believe, of a typical uh, digital camera, 8 megapixels nowadays. And so you can see that uh, there's a lot of space off to the left, and, and I've done that for a purpose because this is not a widescreen uh, picture. But you can see the amount of details that you normally get in a photo like this. Uh, it's not a bad photo by any, by any sense of the words, but uh, when we move on to the next photo, we can see the difference that it makes. Here is a typical photo taken by the widescreen camera. You can see just how much more detail you can get. Now that building in the background is just about one city block away, so you can see how much more uh, of of a scene uh, of a scenery you can pick up with a widescreen as opposed to the normal, um, I think four by three aspect ratio camera that you know most people have with their digital cameras or their cell phone cameras. So uh, yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, just leave them at the bottom, and I'll uh, and I'll respond to them as best I can.